So let's continue our series, Victory in a Sanctuary. I have to get right to it. You want to take some good notes? We already know what Psalm 77, 13 says, Thy way is in the what? Sanctuary. Who is great? A God as our God. The earthly sanctuary is a pattern of the heavenly sanctuary. We know that in order to have victory over sin, we must go to the pathway to God's throne. We must go through the sanctuary. And don't you know the sanctuary is a pattern of the cross? You see the pattern of the cross. As soon as you come into the sanctuary, you come at the foot of the cross. That's where the sacrifice happened. You come at the cleansing, at the labor. Then you go through the holy place. We go through those five pillars into the holy place. We see the table, show bread, the, the candlestick, the altar, and then we go to the most holy place. But this is the pattern of the cross, which is the pattern of our salvation. Amen. Right there. Don't you know God is calling us to holiness? The Old Testament, it calls us to holiness. Leviticus 19.2, it says what? Speak unto all the congregation of the children of Israel and say unto them, Ye shall be what? Holy, for I the Lord your God am holy. You know, that's what we're trying to get is holiness. In the New Testament, there's a call to holiness. It says in 1 Peter 1.15, But... But as he which hath called you is what? Holy, so be ye holy in all. In what, everybody? In all matter of conversation. And conversation, original Greek, is behavior. And verse 16 says, because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. So is there a call for holiness? Does everybody understand the call? The main thing is, do we want to respond to the call? God calls all of us to be holy, not just for the super Christians, not just for those people who want to know more. We're talking about all Christians to be holy as God is holy in all matter of behavior, in all matter of things. Now we look at this, it's interesting, because we know when we go into the, uh, the holy place, holy and sanctified is synonymous. It is the same thing. Purify. And we know when we first, when we go into the we already know the courtyard is our justification. We talked about that a lot. But we go into the tabernacle. That's our sanctification. See, the holy place is a sanctified place. Did you catch it? Did you miss it? The holy place is a sanctified place because it's synonymous. It's the same thing. Sanctified to mean holy. Holy means sanctified. Or to be made pure. So we go into the sanctified place. And then we go into the most sanctified place. And that's at the Ark of the Covenant. And we studied this before, the justification and the sanctification justification happens in the courtyard. Sanctification happens in the tabernacle itself. We studied that. That's the only quick review I can do over the sanctuary. Because now i got to get into holy men in the sanctuary. Y'all got it? Y'all with me? Y'all with me? I, I had to get right into it because I didn't know it was going to go that deep. Who were the officials that served in the sanctuary? Let's look at that. Who were the officials? Let's go to Exodus 28.1. And we're going to look at Exodus 29.44. And take thou unto thee Aaron thy brother and his sons with him from among the children of Israel, that he may minister unto me the priest's office, even Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, Eleazar, it hath my and Aaron's sons. And then we go to Exodus 29, 44. I will sanctify the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar. I will sanctify also both Aaron and his sons to do what? To minister to me in the priest's office. So it's very clear that God had priests. They're the ones that actually ministered inside the sanctuary, inside the outer court and the holy place. And we know once a year, the high priest went to the most holy place. But let's look at the hierarchy here the way the Lord set it up. We see here clearly only those who officiated inside the sanctuary were only the priest. They had the high priest. There's only one high priest. And that was Aaron. And then by blood, by what? By blood, by relations, the blood, you had the priest, which were the sons of Aaron. Now, where do they serve in the sanctuary and how often? This is very important. We're just laying some foundation. Where do they serve and how often? Now, we know that the, both the priests and the high priests, they served in the courtyard and in the holy place daily. 
Okay, I got that. Daily. They went to the courtyard, doing the sacrifices at the laver, went inside the temple, showed bread, the, the candlesticks and the altar of incense. They did it every single day. We find this here in Hebrews 9, 6. That was both. Both the high priest and the priest. They went in those two... They were able to go to the courtyard and the holy place every day. Hebrews 9, 6. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priest went always into the first tabernacle accomplishing the service of God. Okay. Now we notice that the high priest only went into the most holy place once a year. How long? How often? Once a year. Now who can go in there? Only the high priest. The priest cannot go in the holy place. Only the high priest can go into the holy place. We see here in Hebrews 9, 3, it says, and after the second veil, we know that separate, the separate tricks. We know what that means. The two modes of behavior. The, between the holy place and the most holy place. Between a daily service and the yearly service. Okay? And the second and after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which is the most holy place. And then verse 7, it says, but unto the second went the high priest alone. How often? Once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself, but for the heirs of the people. So he went in there one time a year. So daily, they both, the high priest and the priest were in the courtyard in the holy place. But once a year, the high priest went into the most holy place. Now. Who does a high priest represent? All right, trying to, who does a high priest represent? Let's go ahead and look at some, some things here. Who does he represent? Let's go to Hebrews 4.14. Let's get some Bible scripture. Hebrews 4.14. And it says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our profession. So, is that pretty clear, everybody? Who is a high priest? No other than Jesus Christ. So, Aaron represented Christ during the whole administration. All the high priests were supposed to represent Christ. So, when people saw the high priest, it was a prophecy of the Messiah. The coming Messiah. Not only was it a prophecy of what the coming Messiah was going to do here on earth, but it was also a prophecy what the the Messiah was going to do in heaven. We'll learn that in a little bit. Let's look at verse 15. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched without, with the feelings of our infirmities, but he was in all points tempted as we are, and yet without sin. So it's clear. Who's our high priest? Another end in Jesus Christ. It's very simple. Clear. Now, this is another question. <laughs> I'm going, now we're going to dig a little deeper. All right? Let's see if you know. Where did Jesus go? Remember to understand the high priest represents Jesus Christ. But where did Jesus go when he went back to heaven? Where did Jesus go when he went back to heaven? Where did he go? Do you want to know? Well, you know he went to heaven. But where in heaven did he go specifically? This is extremely important. This is extremely important to show, to reveal clearly what Jesus, where he went after he died and went back to heaven. Okay, after he left the disciples here, remember he went back to heaven, he said, uh, he went on back to heaven. And he said, this same Jesus, he will come back in like manner. So we know that Jesus is going to come from the clouds. He's not going to come in secret. He's not going to just pluck people off the earth. The Bible makes it very clear. He's going to come back the same way he left. But anyway, Hebrews 9, 11, But Christ being come, and high priest of good things to come, but a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. So where's this tabernacle at? It's not made of hands. Where's it at? It's where? In heaven. Verse 12, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the, what everybody? Holy place. Don't miss it. He went into the holy place, having attained the eternal redemption for us. So don't you know, the whole plan of salvation was not done. It was not complete here on earth. It wasn't finished yet. It wasn't done yet. Not going to be done until the Lord says himself, it is finished. Yes, he finished one aspect of the plan. He died on his earth. But he still wasn't done. He still had another aspect. Another, another peace. And he went to the holy place. Now this is a warning. Warning, 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 warning. Because this is so critical. 
If you have an NIV version, if it has an NIV version, NIV says he entered once into the most holy place. That is totally wrong. Because there's a clear distinction between the holy place and the most holy place. That is, you're going to, they have it in the New King James Version too. It says the most, and I'm like, what? The Bible does not say that. It didn't say that. You go to some older versions, like the reverse, rise standard version, it says it like this. You go to some older versions, it says it's just like this. It's these newer versions that's coming up with some whole most holy place. We got to be very careful. We need to study. That's why I stick with the King James, actually. Even if, I, don't even, I don't even read, I got some new King James here, I don't even read it. That's exactly, I had a whole week. So we see here clearly, in heavenly sanctuary, Jesus went and ministered where, everybody? The holy place. The Bible is extremely clear because we understand the cleansing of the sanctuary. We understand where he went next. So we see Jesus Christ's work did not begin until his sacrificial work in the courtyard of earth was complete. So this was Jesus' earthly ministry. It was, it was symbolic, what we saw in the courtyard, symbolic of Jesus' earthly ministry. What did he do on his earth? What was his main mission? To, to tell people about his sacrifice, to tell them about the Messiah, to tell them about the Father. But what was his main mission? To die on the cross, to cleanse us from sin. And that's what he did right there. He sacrificed right in the sanctuary. Then he went to heaven into the holy place. So right here we see the heavenly ministry is in heaven as we speak because we understand there is a heavenly sanctuary. The Bible's extremely clear about that. And we just read about that. A, a place made without hands. Not man's hands, but God put it together. Now where is Jesus in heavenly ministry now? Is he still in the holy place? Because if he still, remember they said, the Bible says, follow the land wherever he goes. You need to follow the land wherever he goes. So if he, he, if he moved from the holy place to somewhere else, you may be stuck. And that's where a lot of Christians are stuck today. They don't even know where God is at. They don't even know where Jesus is at. They say he's in heaven. Yeah, he's in heaven. But where's he doing in heaven? Well, he's just there. What is he doing? He has something. Well, you know, I got good news, but I got bad news. We got the answer, but the bad news is not today. <laughs> and that's going to be another time. I couldn't get into that right now. Now, who does the priest? Now, we, the high priest represents who? Jesus Christ. No, that's clear about that. Now, who does the priest represent? Let's see what the Bible says. I like this. Because you see the connection. Remember, God is calling us to holiness. He said, be holy as God is holy. We should be holy too. Here, look at this. Exodus, Exodus 19, Exodus 19, 6. And ye shall be unto me a what? Kingdom of? Priest. Kingdom of what? Priest. And a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of of Anson County. Amen. Of the children of Israel. It's very clear here. We should be, we are a kingdom. That's his whole, he said, we are, you are a kingdom of priests. Not only are you a kingdom of priests, but you're a kingdom of royalty. You're a kingdom of, you're the sons and daughters of God. You're princes and princesses. Now, what does First Peter say? So we found that in the Old Testament. Did God continue this thought in the New Testament? Let's see what he says in First Peter 2 9. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal what? priesthood you see a royal priesthood you're not just a priest but you are king you are of the kingly priest but we are a royal priesthood a holy nation a peculiar people a what peculiar and the word peculiar does not mean weird it just means in original greek you are the property of god you are his prized possession. Just like the jewels. And you'll see later on as we end this message out that we are his precious jewels. A peculiar people. That ye should show forth the praise of him who call you out of darkness into his marvelous light.
So the priest under the high priest represents the people of God. So remember, you have the priest. There's only one high priest. We know that's Jesus Christ. And the priests and all the other priests are supposed to be the people of God making up the kingdom of God. So God has called us to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Y'all got that? Pretty simple. Pretty good. Now, could the high priest... Now, could the high priest... And priests wear just anything while they are ministering in the sanctuary. Can a priest or high priest just wear anything? Can they just, you know, just come in and with anything? Let's go to Exodus 15, 19. Exodus 15, 19. The clothes of service to do service in the holy place. The holy garments for Aaron and the priest and the garments of his son to minister in the priest's office. So we see that these garments or these clothes were what? Holy. So they couldn't just walk in with anything, could they? Now I, I can just step in there and say, let me get dressed today and just walk in with anything. It says here in Exodus, verse, Exodus 28 verse 2, And thou shalt make what type of garments? Holy. In other words, it's sacred, set apart from any normal garments. Make holy garments for Aaron, thy brother, for the glory. For the what? Glory and for the beauty of who? Of God. Now we know very clearly the glory of God is the character of God. And if I had the character of God, my life would reflect clearly the love of God. And it would be beautiful, right? It would be beautiful. So we see that they just can't just walk in with anything. Now again, we see that the garments were holy to reflect the beauty of God. The garments of the priests and the high priests. I want you to notice this here. It says, everything connected with the apparel and deportment of the priests was to be such as to impress the beholder with a sense of holiness of God, the sacredness of his worship, and the purity required of those who came into his presence. Let that sink in a little bit. Because we are called to be a holy nation. A nation of what? Priests. And remember, God has, he has separated their garments from everybody else's normal garments. He made their garments holy. And their holy garments are supposed to point to who? God. The character of God in everything. The question is, does our dress code matter? Does it really matter? As people of God, as children of God, does it really matter what I wear? Because remember, God has called us to be a peculiar people, a holy nation of priests. How should we dress if we are priests of the kingdom of God? In other words, does our dress, our, should our dress be modest, reflecting the pure character of God? Have you ever served the saying, what's in the inside will reflect what's on the outside? Your inside will reflect the dress on the outside. Just think about a prostitute. How's her dress going to be? What's her thinking like? Just think of a, 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 a hip hopper. What's his dress going to be like? Because what's his thinking like? What's an inside? So if we truly have the love of God in us, our dress will reflect that. Clearly reflect that. Now can you imagine Jesus bagging? Jesus coming around, you know. Bagging. You know, I mean, I just cannot believe it. My mind, I just, I, can't, I still cannot comprehend this. I'm driving down, you know, on 109. Well, actually over there by, by, by um, you know, IGA area. And I see this dude, literally. It was, I don't know, they were jogging pants or whatever. Literally holding his pants here, way down here, and the best is way down there. What's in the mind? What's in the mind? And Renee said, I don't know, maybe nothing, right? <laughs> I mean, you're thinking, well, what's in the mind? Can you imagine Jesus dressing like that? Can you imagine Jesus going around, yo, 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 man, look at my dress. And we're looking like the world. Jesus would not look like the world. Jesus, God wants us to have good quality clothes, of course. You know, something that's going to last. But something that's going to cover everything. Something that's going to cover 
Can you imagine Jesus approving his women minister to show off their, you know, <laughs> cleavage and looking sexy? You know, that stuff is kind of, crept, that stuff is kind of crept into the church. You know why? Because we watch a lot of Jay Leno's and what's his man's name? Um, uh, Harvey, Harvey. Steve Harvey, yeah. We watch a lot of that stuff. And it affects our what? If it affects our thinking, what's going to affect our inside is going to come what? On our outside. It is very, very clear. So our dress should reflect the glory of God, not trying to look like the world. We're not trying to look sexy and cool like the world. We're trying to look, be like who? Who are we trying to be like? Jesus. Jesus. That guy didn't say he had a dress weird. He just says, dress appropriate for the glory of God. You know, the reality is, if I'm advertising, what should I advertise? The world or Christ? Should I become a billboard for, hey, come and have me? Or I should say a billboard for who? Christ. That's the bottom line. That should be a billboard advertisement for him, not the world. Now, let's look at this. What is the significance of one of the garments of the priest's Known as the coat. Now don't miss this. It's known as the what everybody? The coat. He had the coat. Let's go to Exodus 39, 27. Exodus 39, 27. This is interesting. And they made what? Coats of fine linen of woven work for Aaron and for his son. So it's very, it's very clear. But both Aaron, the high priest, and the priest wore this coat. So who wore the coat? The high priest and the priest wore this coat. Now coat in the Hebrew. We go to coat in the Hebrew. Kotineth. Meaning to cover. Everybody got that? Means to what? To cover. And oh, don't miss this, everybody. Because in Genesis 3:21, after Adam and Eve sinned, he made them what? Coats of skin. To what? To cover. Because before. Remember after Adam and Eve sinned and they ran away from God? They picked up some, them, some figs, sold them some fig leaves, tried to cover themselves. But God said, that's not enough. You need a coat. You need what, everybody? <laughs> you need a coat of skin. So he gave them a coat of skin to cover. So coat means to cover. And we notice that this coat was made of what? Fine linen. We already know what that means. I don't have to go in detail with that. But that fine linen, that's bleached white, represents the what? The righteousness of Jesus Christ. So God wants to cover us totally with the what? Righteousness of who? Jesus yeah, you're with me now. Now what else significant of the coat was that wo wo woven work? So we understand the coat is the covering. But also it is a woven work. Now woven work means it was made of one piece. In other words, when we normally wear, make coats or t-shirts or shirts, we usually cut a pattern and then we put both, both, you know, we cut it and we put things together. We put it all together, you know, just like this. I have a seam here, just like my pants, there's a seam right here. But the way they made it, they made it all in one piece, woven in one piece. So in other words, you look at the pants, there would be no seam in it. Now both the priest and the high priest wore the coat made with bleach white linen, woven in one piece. And we understand that represents the righteousness of Christ. Now Christ and his righteousness is whole without tear. Understand that. Christ and his righteousness is whole without tear. Does God have any tear in his righteousness? Is there any tear in his character? He, we, that's why we all need to be clothed with the seamlessness, the seamless cover, the seamless coat of God. We need to be covered by that. Because that covering, that seamless covering does not reflect any nakedness at all. That's why God wants to be totally covered. Not only physically, but also spiritually. Now let's go to Isaiah 61 verse 10. And we learn a lot just from this, the priest and the high priest and how they were covered. Now this is kind of powerful right here. Isaiah 61 verse 10. I will graciously rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. For he hath clothed me with the garments of what? Salvation. And he hath covered me with the robe. And robe means covering of what? Righteousness. As a bridegroom decketh herself with ornaments and as a bride adorneth herself with jewels. 
You see the covering? He said he's going to cover you totally with his righteousness. Now what are we going to wear in heaven as a priest of God? The Bible makes it very clear in Revelation 19.7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb is come. And his wife have made himself ready. Verse 8. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in what? Fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Of saints. Is that pretty clear? Man, I love this. I'm just, only thing I'm doing is reading Bible text to you all day. <laughs> Ooh, I, I like sermons like that. Just read Bible text. Let's look. Let's continue. That's pretty clear. Can't even get any clearer than that. Now, what are the two, oh, this is, this is, now you're ready to go a little deeper. Just a little bit deeper. All right, so we got there. We understand the coat means covering. Now, what are the two symbolic rejection of Christ's righteousness that was displayed before he was put to death? What are the two symbolic rejection of Christ's righteousness that was displayed before he was put to death? Now, you got to be very careful about this now because it'll make sure. Is that me, Lord? Is that me, Lord? Is that, have, I, have I rejected your righteousness, Lord? I don't, I don't want that. No, that, that, them clothes look too conservative for me. I need something that's going to give me a little big zing, a little bling. What is the Lord saying? Let's go to Mark 14, 46. It's kind of, I'm just going to move through it pretty quickly because it's interesting. This is when Jesus, remember Jesus was actually in the Garden of Gethsemane and Judas portrayed him, right? It's interesting in the Gospel of Mark there is a weird scene that goes on and everybody's like so where'd that come from <laughs> i mean it's like it just like came out of nowhere but let's look at it let's look at this weird scene that kind of happens in uh, mark chapter 14 verses 46 because for a while i was just wondering like why in the world that didn't make sense okay but now it makes sense and they laid their hands on him and took him and one of them that stood by drew a sword and smote the servant of the high priest and cut his ear off. We know that was Peter. And in verse 48, and Jesus answered and said unto them, Are ye come out as a thief with swords and staves to take me? I was daily with you in the temple preach teaching, and ye took me not, but the scriptures must be fulfilled. What did he say? The what? The scriptures must be fulfilled. Then he says, talking about his disciples, and they all did what? Forsook him and fled. 